Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon, and I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University. Welcome to Vlog 290. <laughs> How to complete a PhD without a supervisor. Now, how did we get here? Well, it is an interesting story. This vlog does come via request from one of the great supporters of this vlog series for years, Buffalo Buffalo. Respect, Buffalo Buffalo. BB asked me, quote, Tara, I really want you to speak about your journey as a PhD student and how you managed a thesis without any supervisory help. I think it will be helpful for students to have a vlog on that. BB, my pleasure to deliver today. So this vlog has a personal aspect to it. Now, normally I don't do this degree of personal stuff. You've heard me say in the past, whenever a sentence commences with, when I did my PhD, invariably the rest of that sentence is rubbish. So I rarely do the, when I did my PhD, I don't do that stuff. But today, I will be expressing some of that narrative and that story, and I think in tough times for international higher education, this may be a useful story. But the literature I've deployed, I've had to in many ways read it against the grain, because there is a lot of literature out there about good and bad supervisors. So we've got the white hats and the black hats. And normally what those pieces are doing are helping students try and make that situation better or indeed improve the bad supervisors. Today I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm looking at the black hats. I'm looking at the bad supervisors and I'm not trying to improve them. Don't go changing. So it's a bit of a Billy Joel event today. So I'm not going to change or comment or question the bad supervisors. I'm going to take the bad supervisors as read. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to explore what you can do about this in your own life. Not to change those supervisors, but to finish your PhD or research masters on your own terms. Now, BB is right. I have had truly shocking supervision through my academic career. Now for my research masters, and here it is, for my research masters, I had two supervisors. Now one of those supervisors, the moment I enrolled, immediately went on sabbatical and did not return. The other supervisor, and this is the great story of this, the other supervisor didn't meet with me for the two entire years of this research master's degree, yes, you've heard that correctly, so missed 50 meetings, missed every meeting every fortnight, did not come to one of them. And then when it came for me as an impossibly young woman to arrive at my university and to submit my master's degree on Christmas Eve, can you imagine, I'm now so excited, submitting this on Christmas Eve, and handed over these bound coffee copies to the examination office. I had to submit that master's degree without any signatures confirming that I could submit it. And indeed, it took an entire year to be examined. So the PhD, the master's, wasn't signed off by those supervisors. Now my PhD, and here she is, my uh, PhD is even messier. I had a supervisor who was not only an incompetent supervisor, but an incompetent human. And when we had meetings, those meetings had to be in the coffee shop, and I had to buy him a coffee. And what he would do during those meetings is talk about himself. So our supervisory meetings would involve him endlessly retelling his career narrative to me, how terribly important he was, and also lots and lots of gossip about people that he despised. Now, I remember when one meeting I was trying to get him a bit focused, I was working on a particular researcher and scholar at that point, and I did would, wanted some sort of assistance, or let's talk through an interpretation of this scholar, and I mentioned her name, and he replied to that name, quote, a passionless woman, and I should know, I slept with her. <laughs> End of quote. 
and the quiet. <laughs> oh. oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, wow. Okay. So, really early on in my candidature, I got a job. A lectureship in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and this particular supervisor said, don't go to New Zealand, you'll never make it back. Great. So, of course, I completely ignored him because he was an incompetent human, and I left the university and the country, and I finished this PhD at a distance. Now, this was a long, long time ago. This was 1993 and 1994. Many of you young Skywalkers were not born. But at this point, 993, 94, the digital doctorate was not a thing. And to be frank, online learning really wasn't a thing. So I gave myself the task, and I remember doing this as a young person, that I was going to finish a chapter every three weeks. Now, I'd always got up up to that point at 4 a.m., so I'd always got up early. My entire family have always got up early. And I decided, right, well, to get this thesis done, I'm going to get myself up at 3 a.m. And I'm going to do two hours on the thesis every morning, three to five, and then start my day that would be my first full-time, quite intense uh, lectureship. And I had to do this because I knew, and I was right, I knew that I would not get my next job, and it was a year-long contract, I would not get my next job if I didn't have that PhD finished. So I spent what very little money I had posting these chapters each three weeks to my supervisor. Now, I never heard from him. No feedback, no letters, no calls, nothing. So I just kept posting the chapters until the thesis was complete. Now, I wrote to him and said, I'm submitting. Had to submit, about to start a new job, had to have the thesis done to start the new job. So I said, I'm submitting. No response from him once more. And you know what? I submitted. And he replied that he would not sign off the submission because he had not read it and I needed to resend all of those chapters. Now, I refused to do that for many reasons. One was I had run out of money. I had no money to even buy milk for coffee let alone being able to afford postage back to Western Australia. So that thesis was submitted. I went, bye, I'm out of here, thesis submitted. Now, I was lucky because at that particular university, there were fantastic professional staff members who ran the examination office. And those remarkable women took that thesis and put it through examination. Wow. Now, that thesis... This thesis was returned with three ones. In some systems, that's called three A's. So that is passed without correction. Now, I never heard from the supervisor through all that success. Surprise, surprise. But the story does continue, colleagues. Because remember, the years passed. And that's nearly 30 years ago now. And what's happened in those subsequent 30 years? Well, in those 30 years, he wrote me one bad reference, never used him again, uh, wrote one bad reference, described me as a reasonably mediocre teacher, and we don't know what's going to happen in her research. He called me, by the way, a mediocre teacher after I'd won the Prime Minister's Award for the best teacher in the country. So that gives you some vibe. But luckily, I got the nod that he's not trustworthy. Don't ask him to write your references again. And I never did. So wrote me a bad reference, bad mouthed me, abused me publicly and privately. But then much to my amusement, always attempted to use me through those subsequent 30 years to get me to assign his textbooks to my courses. And indeed, even when he was forced to retire in his 70s, think of all the great people that have been restructured out of our universities in the last five years. And this person was allowed to retire in their 70s. And he sent an email and asked me to review his new book so that it would sell. Bizarre story, yeah? Tragically, it's true. And it's also brilliantly funny because the person that this happened to ended up becoming, at one point of their career, a dean 
of graduate research. So this has all been spooky. But from this experience, can I say that I have a whole other narrative that I will share with you, probably at the end of this gig today, about a research master's in education, which is also an appalling story of supervision that's very different. So as you can see, I've done three research degrees through my career. I've had three truly appalling supervisory experiences. So I am three for three. So let's talk about, therefore, how to finish a PhD or a research master's without a supervisor. Now, this discussion matters more than ever, and that's why I think I agreed to BB's request. I don't like doing the sort of personal narrative because pretty dreadful people do that. Let me just talk about me, and we, we ain't got time for that, yeah. But why this discussion matters now about supervising yourself is because our higher education sector is in a very bad way. With endless restructures, the sickness of supervisors, often through the stress, redundancies, retirements, and resignations. So this is an incredibly volatile time in international higher education. Now, 10 years ago, even up to 10 years ago, the scholar, the supervisor, the advisor who commenced with you, with your PhD, and probably they probably taught you from first year, to be honest with you, but if they had, they'd been at the university a long time, and the chances are they'd probably retire at that university. So it was a stable situation for doctoral education. Now, this situation is stable no more. So you have to go into a doctoral program with your eyes wide open and be prepared for changes in your supervision. And indeed, you've got to front up and be prepared to be able to get this thesis submitted and graduate on your own. Now, this is a pretty good skill, not only for higher degree students, but also to survive not only in the contemporary university sector, but the contemporary workplace. So here are my 10 tips, Tara's 10 tips, to supervise yourself. One, different disciplines make supervising yourself more difficult. So I want to put in this crucial caveat at the start. Now, if you are in the experimental sciences or the experimental health sciences, then what I'm talking about today is much more difficult, but there are still solutions to your problems. Because often what happens in these disciplines is you have been slotted into your supervisor's often funded project. So you're probably using brand new kit, you've got new equipment that you need to know, new methodologies, new research designs, right? So you're being slotted into an already existing project. So you are reliant on your supervisor in a way that doesn't exist in other disciplines. But I've got two crucial strategies for you to enable, at least in the end stages, the final third of your thesis, that you can supervise yourself. And can I say, these strategies are also useful for allied health, which is an increasing area of doctoral supervision, obviously, but also in the applied social sciences with some field work as well. So the first crucial bit of advice, please, is finish your data collection as quickly as possible. Seriously, learn the kit learn the equipment, get that literature of you down and sorted, find the gap, and get your data collection done. Now, once you have the data, you are far freer to finish under your own steam. My second piece of advice is particularly important for our colleagues in lab based environments. So it is a group project, three, four, five, ten, fifteen PhD students and postdocs are working on a particular project, yeah? So very common again. Now, what you need to do as early as possible in your candidature, make sure that the boundaries are as clear as you can make them between the different PhD students. So I cannot tell you how often in my office students right at the end of their candidature. The group is still deciding who is doing what, what's in this PhD, what's in that PhD, how do we make those, those separations. And can I say, examiners pick up on that 
and some other problems emerge through that. So as early as possible, establish your little piece of the cake, establish your focus, your original contribution to knowledge and the parameter or the frame around what you are doing. Now, if you're clear about the parameters of your thesis, then you've got your original contribution to knowledge, okay, you've got your data collection in place, and then you can pick up your research and finish it under your own steam. And this happens very frequently in the experimental sciences that you get a job in the final year often and you have to take that opportunity. You have to these days, you can't knock it back. If you get a job, you've got to take it, right? But you've got to finish the thesis as well. So it also is important if your supervisor leaves, if your supervisor retires, if your supervisor is made redundant or indeed something weird happens. It's a university. As the great Captain Janeway used to say, weird is part of the job. So therefore, get your thesis to the point where whatever happens, you can write, you can edit, you can draft, and you can submit as quickly as possible. Two, go into every suspension or intermission with your eyes open. All oh, this is an important one. Now, around the world, in all the systems that exist around the world, students have systems where if something goes wrong, they can suspend or intermit from their candidature. Now, this is absolutely fine. You have a right to do that. I understand it. But you need to intermit with your eyes wide open. Now, if you disconnect from your thesis for three months or six months, do not think that there will be business as usual upon your return. So you need to go into any intermission or suspension knowing that your supervisory team may be different upon your return. Now I'm telling you this so that if you can, you work as hard as you can, as early as you can, to give yourself a fighting chance of finishing. Now, there are many reasons I want students to finish quickly. Firstly, they get their life back. Your families get their lives back. But secondly, the reason I'm encouraging you to do this, colleagues, is because I know that the longer the situation goes on, the less likely your supervisory team will be stable. The longer you are enrolled, the less likely your supervisory team will remain intact. Three, establish productive patterns. It is your responsibility to establish daily patterns for work. Do not rely on your supervisor to push you. The students, to be frank, that I know are in trouble are the ones that are completely reliant on their supervisor, particularly reliant on their supervisor for motivation or to push them. You must be self-motivated. But you know what? Motivation means nothing if it doesn't create productive behaviours. Now, if you are going to supervise yourself, you need a plan and you need to guarantee particular behaviours in yourself. Now, I finished all my research degrees while I was pretty well in full-time work. And I did it by getting up early, knowing I've got no plan B. If I don't finish this, no one's going to finish it for me and I'll be out of work. So there's no plan B and therefore I had to finish. The only person I could rely on was myself. And if you think about it, that's actually the truth of doctoral education. The only person you can rely on is yourself. It is your thesis. You are the only person who's going to do that work and the only person you can rely on is yourself. Four, remember you are not your thesis. Now students get really confused between their research and their identity. Now, you are not your thesis. And that's why I think students become so cross and so distraught when the supervisor walks away or the supervisor drifts away because they assume the supervisor's not interested in them and they take it personally as a personal rejection. But always remember that you must treat your thesis like a job. Don't romanticise universities. 
seriously. Do not romanticize universities. They are workplaces and they're pretty troubled workplaces at the moment. So treat your research as work and treat your research as separate from your identity. Recognize that many supervisors, advisors can't save themselves at the moment. They might have the best will in the world, but if they have been rendered redundant, then they're just a little bit more focused on how they're going to pay their mortgage and who's going to look after their kids rather than your thesis. Now, you may not want to believe that, but that is true. So you're going to have to finish this thesis with very little supervision. You're going to have to grind out a result. This is not going to be pleasant. It's work. So do the work. Five, manage your emotions. Don't stay in anger or rage. Now, most of the students I see in my office, and I mean about 90% of the students I see in my office, blame their supervisor for something. A lack of feedback, authorship issues, lack of teaching opportunities, inability for the supervisor to get the student a job. Pick and mix. Now, for example, I had a student complain about me. And the reason the student complained about me is I cancelled a meeting with that student to undertake my five-day honeymoon with Jamie. Now, I wish I was joking. So I cancelled one meeting and went on my honeymoon for five days and the student complained. So as you can see, st students are very locked into at the moment what supervisors should be doing. Ask yourself if that's you. Do you think a lot about what your supervisor should be doing? And of course, what that does is it stops the realisation about what the student should be doing. Now, the reason I finished my research degrees without supervisors and very quickly is because I had no interest in judging or complaining about the supervisor's behaviour. I didn't have time to complain. I had to get on with it. I had to make a living. I didn't have time to complain. So what the supervisors did or did not do is actually irrelevant because I had to finish. I had to finish for me. I had to finish for my future. Anger, complaining, won't finish your thesis. Doing the work will. Get on with it. Six, back yourself. Too many students relinquish power to their supervisors. You know, the all-knowing messiah model of supervision. Now, supervisors are people. You're a person. Supervisors very bright, but so are you. You're very bright. So use that brilliance. Work hard, commit, dig in, create productive patterns, and back yourself. Get on with it. Finish the thesis. Believe that you can do it, and you do not need your supervisor to create belief in yourself. Seven. Be grateful for any support you do receive. The supervision that I received, <laughs> it, look, it wouldn't happen now because the supervisor would be under report, they'd be publicly humiliated through social media, and the scrutiny is different because we now ensure that supervisors undergo mandatory training. There are minimum standards that a supervisor has to hit. And of course, students do complain a lot. There's a lot of opportunity for students com to complain now, and they do. And think about it, even when a supervisor misses a meeting for a honeymoon, that's an opportunity for complaint. But instead of investing in this complaint culture, which places all the attention on the supervisor and what they're doing wrong, focus on yourself. Focus on your thesis, but also be grateful for any support you do receive. We've often talked about in this vlog series about the value of low expectations. So instead of being disappointed about what you're not receiving, be thankful for what you are receiving. So to this day, to this day, I'm grateful to my supervisors because what they taught me 
was how not to supervise. It was my first lesson in supervision, learning how to supervise myself. And I probably, in fact, almost definitely, wouldn't be in this job as Dean of Graduate Research if this supervisory situation had not occurred. That's a blessing. Eight, ooh, be professional with everyone. Your supervisors are not your spouse. They're not your friend. So keep the relationship professional, decent, ethical, and respectful. But I also want you to remember to respect every single human that you meet on the doctoral journey. And that includes professional staff. Whatever these remarkable colleagues are referred to around the world, sometimes support staff, administrators, professional staff. Always remember my story, seriously. Remember my story. It was the administrators, the professional staff in a graduate school that enabled my thesis to be presented to examination. Remember that everyone can help you and everybody deserves respect. So don't think about that person as, quote, just an administrator. As a student referred to one of our colleagues this week, oh, they're just an administrator. Really? That administrator might be the very person that enables your completion. So if you are supervising yourself, then of course everyone, an entire village, can be of use to you. And speaking of a village, nine. Create that support system beyond your supervisor. You are the star of your own life. You are the star of your own thesis. But assemble a community of support. In the first week that I enrolled in this master's degree, I think I was about 21 years old, first week I enrolled, I met a librarian and an incredible librarian spent two hours with me. Remember, I'd done a history degree, so libraries I thought I knew about, archive, that's what I do. And this remarkable librarian spent two weeks with that impossibly, two weeks, two hours with this impossibly young woman and explained systems and library systems to me. And that two hours with that remarkable librarian changed my life. So meet your librarians early. Meet your higher degree coordinators, meet your dean. The academics that are making professional development available to you. So gather all these support services. Learning is never wasted. So get learning. The reason we learn is so that we know what we don't know. So get proactive, get learning, surround yourself with people that hold expertise. And therefore, by learning from these people, you will be able to supervise yourself. 10. Have pride in your achievements and recognise the gift of being a self-sourcing PhD student. Now, I once had a great PhD student in my office and I said, how are you going? And they described themselves as a self-sourcing pudding. I love that. Changed my life. Who are you? I'm a self-sourcing pudding. Are you? Brilliant. Now, I want to finish with the great pride you must feel in supervising yourself, overcoming adversity, getting on with it, no excuses, no complaints. Now, my experience in supervising myself has transformed my life. I never gave up, and you know what? I never give up. Never. I expect poor behaviour from academics I have throughout my entire career and therefore I'm never disappointed when I see it. I know I can fight hard, I know I can finish against the odds because I've done it before and I'll do it again. But let me share one other gift of being a self-sourcing pudding. <laughs> let me share a secret with you. Now when I started this PhD, my supervisor used that usual ridiculous line. 
because he was supervising me, he had to be the co-author on everything because he was supervising. Now remember, this was really early. The Vancouver Protocol was just happening at this point, right? So because he was a supervisor, he had to be a co-author on everything. Now I was pretty young and pretty naive, but I knew that was rubbish <laughs> even then. And I also knew that was not gonna happen, girlfriend. So because he completely disconnected, because he admitted that he never read a word of the thesis, it meant there was no doubt that I could publish on my own. And the important bit of this story is this thesis, and you want people to talk about, oh, I've got three articles, I've got five articles in my thesis. 13 articles, 13 articles came from this PhD. And from that, I was on my way. And that's how I got into work and that's how I got into tenure so quickly. So I want to finish with one final story about my education research master's degree. Now, of course, I wrote that thesis entirely on my own, entirely on my own, with absolutely no contact from the supervisor at all. It was at a distance and no contact from the supervisor at all. Now, as a courtesy, when the full thesis was finished and I was about to submit it, I sent the document to my inverted commas supervisor fully complete. They had no role in it at all. It was a courtesy email. And this was, by the way, this thesis was to become my book, The University of Google. Now, this book made my career. When I die, which I hope will not be soon, when I die, my obituary will read Tara Brabazon, comma, the author of The University of Google. Right. Now, this supervisor, upon receiving this, this document, stated that she didn't understand remotely what was going on here because, after all, <laughs> there was no University of Google. So she didn't even understand the title, and yet she confirmed in this email that she was going to be a co-author on all publications. So she didn't even understand the title, and she wanted to be a co-author. Now, what I need to tell you is this was only 15 years ago. And why that matters is I was a full professor holding a British chair when this statement about co-authorship happened. Now, she made a big mistake there because <laughs> I simply forwarded on her email to her then dean and the deputy vice chancellor of research of her university and stated, She's got no grounds for this claim at all. The Vancouver Protocol was in place. The codes of conduct were in place by this point. So I just said there's no grounds for her claim at all. In this email, she confirmed she hasn't read the thesis, doesn't even understand the title, and is, you know, claiming authorship. So, you know, you two sort this out. And, of course, that changed the authorship policy pretty radically in that university. And the thing is, if you are a self-made person, if you produce your own research, no one can take that off you. Incompetent supervision gives you the great gift of clarity, particularly in a tough environment for authorship. Now, there is no doubt that if you have a terrific supervisor, it makes your life easier. They write you great references, they get you great jobs, they open doors for you to colleagues and to publications, and they make your candidature a positive experience. Great supervisors are brilliant, they're amazing, they can change your life. But many of us have never and will never have that chance or that opportunity to have that experience. But you know what? Don't give up for me. Don't give up. Supervise yourself. Learn different skills. And you know what? Take great pride that you didn't give up. You put your shoulders back. Head up. Because when bad stuff happened, you got on with it. You made it work. And you know what? That's the greatest skill set that you're going to need for the future of our universities. That's the skill set that will allow higher education to survive. I wish you love, light, 
and peace. Tia.